We are now going to start with the afternoon sessions. Uh, we will now introduce the next speaker, but I also want to introduce Mela Davila, who will be the person in charge of the debate this afternoon. As we heard from Jorge Blasco this morning, he needs she needs no presentation or introduction because she was here with us today, but Mela Davila, no, no need. Okay, she's an expert in archives. She's saying it's not necessary. Okay, so let's hear directly then from Es Ernst van Haufen, who will be um, talking to us this afternoon in a speech on productive archiving, archival practices by artists. I hope that's correct. Ernst is Professor Emeritus at Leiden University and has written lots of papers that relate archives with artistic trajectories and art. And I want to highlight Stein der Geis, Art uh, in New Media. This is a book I truly recommend. because it introduces this dialogue between archive and artistic practices, especially in this sort of um, cultural crisis, which is uh, dominant at the world, arising from the crisis of narratives as well in the world of art. So without going on any further, welcome Ernst, and you have the floor. Uh, thank you. And I would like to begin, like uh, most of the others have done, with thanking the two museums and the organizers for organizing this conference and, of course, also for inviting me. Uh, since, uh, what is it, ten years ago, the archive has become a very uh, fashionable concept, a so-called traveling uh, concept. Uh, so it's not restricted to uh, archival science anymore, but uh, travel to a lot of other uh, disciplines in the humanities and there's always a problem that uh, when a concept becomes fashionable it loses its meaning, it loses its uh, specificity and I think it's very important, this is a good moment to organize a conference on uh, the archive but also exhibition and to go back what in a way the potential but also the limits of this concept of archiving is. And I would like to make uh, my own uh, position or starting point in this discussion about uh, uh, archiving uh, immediately clear. Uh, uh, Eric Keselaar, he uh, quoted me in his talk, and in this quote, I in a way said that uh, the archive has become one a very important uh, and perhaps the most dominant symbolic mode, and what do, do I especially mean with that? Eh? And it has become always narrative was the most important symbolic mode, and now it, is, uh, it has become narrative, which has, is perhaps even more important, or uh, sorry, the archive. Uh, uh, when I say the archive is also a symbolic mode, I mean that uh, it is not restricted to the institutional archive, but it's also, we think, uh, also making loose, uh, use of archival uh, activities. In our thinking, we, we list, we storage, we collect, we categorize, we, we classify. And the, the archival institutions, and many talks uh, took that as their starting point. Uh, and for me, that is, in a way, one very specific manifestation or realization of archival thinking. And that is something we do all the time, archival thinking. Um, yeah, so that's where, where I start. So uh, in, in my whole talk will not be just devoted to uh, no, yeah, real archives, uh, institutional archives or museums or libraries. No, it is more a mode of thinking. Another thing which I should make clear is that my talk is not going to be about art, uh, artist archives, archives of the artist. It is more about artists who model their work on the archive, who create, 
create their work consist out of archiving or listing or whatever. Uh, and the last thing I would, uh, would like to mention before I begin is the day before I uh, left to Barcelona, this book came out and my talk will be uh, more or less based on what is written in this book. It's called Productive Archiving, Artistic Strategies, Future Memories and Fluid Identities. And one part of the book is devoted to archiving uh, histories and memories. The second part is devoted to uh, archiving identities, which has become more and more important uh, in the present with uh, uh, identity politics. And the third part is uh, devoted to archiving objects. Okay. For a long time, the archive was considered to be a practical tool to be employed by scientists, scholars, and administrative institutions. The fact that archival organizations is also employed by, by how we think and organize the world was acknowledged only more recently. Uh, we make sense of the world and direct our lives by making lists, by categorizing, and by making groups of people belonging together based on these categorizations. Like narrative, the archive is also a special mode of thinking. And in this talk, I will explore the possibilities, but also problems of the archive, the harmful and productive effects of archival thinking, and as a result, also of archi archival institutions like museums and in institutional archives in the strictest sense. The medium of the archive is usually, so for me it's important to see it as a medium. The medium of the archive is usually understood in terms of its referential efficiency. An archival list, for example, does not refer generally or metaphorically, but refers to all items, all individuals, and in the case of a Holocaust memorial, to all victims by explicitly naming them all. And more and more monuments, especially Holocaust uh, monuments, but the one of the first monuments who did that was the Vietnam uh, uh, Memorial in Washington, a list all the, the victims. Uh, this quality of uh, archival organization makes the archive as medium into an ideal or perfect instrument for referential objectivity. The, referential, the referentiality of archives is, however, less perfect than it seems when we consider it from a performative or political point of view. This became clear, for instance, during the Second World War because of the role archival organizations had in tracing Jewish inhabitants in countries such as the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Whereas in the Netherlands, 75% of the Jewish population were deported, in Belgium and France, that percentage only added up to respective, respectively 40 and 25%. There are several reasons for these major differences, but one of them is the fact that Dutch municipal archives were perfectly organized, which made it rather easy for the Nazis to find out who was Jewish and who was not. Municipal archives in Belgium and France, by contrast, were rather messy and had all kinds of systemic and organizational imperfections. In those countries, the Nazis had much more, di much more difficulty in tracing Jewish inhabitants. In this respect, the imperfection of messy archives saved the lives of many people. In the case of World War II, the more perfect and is well organized the archive, the more deadly it was. This example suggests that there is no reason to idealize the archival medium. Important as archival organizations may be for cultural memory and scholarly projects, this kind of organization can also be used for counterproductive, even deadly purposes. Uh, genocides, as the Holocaust, for example, but also the one performed by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, were organized as enormous, deadly archival projects. Not only people were categorized based on their ethnic, religious, sexual, or class identity, in the case of the Holocaust, also the belongings of these people were categorized and archived for future use. Death camps and concentration camps were archival machines. But of course, the kind of archival practices I just mentioned are very different. And to better understand in which sense these archives differ, I will make use of an important distinction uh, 
introduced by Aleida Asman between functional archives and storage archives. And also in this conference, we have you uh, refer to all kinds of archives without making a clear distinction between them. And how does she distinguish functional archives from storage archives? Uh, functional archives store what is needed in the present. Uh, medical files, police and tax office files and those of insurance companies are good examples of functional archives. Also, the way users of new media, such as Facebook and Instagram, are being archived happens within a functional archive. The resulting data are being sold to companies so that the users can be targeted for, the, uh, for advertising. In Esman's words, uh, functional, ar I quote, functional archives are the infrastructure and control instruments that guide and support the present. This present is not the present in which acts of memory are being performed, but in which the state controls its subjects and capitalist companies reach out to their potential clients. Within Foucault's distinction between the classical and modern archive, that's another kind of distinction, but he makes that distinction on another basis, one could say that the modern archive is exclusively functional and the storage archive is then the equivalent of what Foucault calls the classical archive. Asman defines storage archives as based on a different logic. They come into being when what is no longer of interest or relevant for the present is sorted out but not immediately thrown away. It is stored in an archive, a museum, a library, and the primary func function of storage archives is history or the enabling and activation uh, of memory. And that last point is very uh, important because uh, what, what people often claim is that in uh, archives or museum, you can find memories. No, a memory, there are no memories in an archive. A memory is an act performed in the present and that establishes a relationship to the past. So and archives do that. They enable the activation <laughs> or, or of memory, but they do not themselves are memories. And it is an act performed in the present by definition. And memory never belongs to the past. The notion of the archive is used literally as well as figuratively. Literally, it refers to the institution or material site, in short, a building filled with documents and objects. Figuratively, figuratively it concerns a much more general and ungraspable notion of knowledge and memory practices not bound by or located in an institutional organization. And, um, and especially Michel Foucault's notion of the archive seems to be responsible for this figurative use. I will not go into that. He used the term archive for the law of what can be said or a set of discursive rules. Such a set of discursive rules consist of specific conceptual distinctions that determine what can be said and what cannot be said. In that sense, discursive rules are all, uh, also always imply exclusions. And those exclusions concern memories, documents, practices of knowledge production that are overlooked, not taken seriously, considered as unimportant or without any value. Exclusions are inherent to any archival organization. This explains why memories and knowledge outside the archive are also part of the archive in the sense of produced by archival rules of exclusion. Archive then covers two kinds of knowledge, knowledge that can be articulated and objectified by convergent discursive rules and knowledge that remains overlooked because of the same discursive rules now working as rules of exclusion. Therefore, an archival organization has by definition both an inside and an outside. In recent years, many social and artistic practices have, at, have had the ambition to include items or identities in the archive that were until then overlooked or excluded from archival organization. A good example uh, is the listing 
um, hence archiving of identities that were for a long time grouped together as perverse, now indicated as LHBTQ+. Although I will criticize the fact that identities are being boxed in by listing them in this way later in this uh, introduction, one positive effect is that identities that for, were for a long time unimaginable or invisible suddenly can be named. And until recently, they were excluded from the archival categories prevalent in Western societies. Their inclusion means that they are now acknowledged in their existence because, as argued earlier, outside the archive there is no proof of that existence. Many contemporary art practices foreground these exclusions from the archive by presenting them as yet another archive. Artists highlight this residue of the archive by collecting images, for instance, that were until then not considered to be archivable. These excluded images are still, are still there, but cannot be looked at because according to the accepted discursive rules, they do not show or articulate anything worth knowing. An example of such an artistic practice transforming exclusions from the archive into an archive in its own right is the Black Photo Album by South African photographer and artist Santu Mofokeng. I will discuss this photo album later in this talk. Another example of an artistic practice based on an inclusion in the archive, what has so far been excluded, is the work of Lebanese artist Walid Raad. He has had great important impact on the rethinking of the archive and its effects. Raad and his fictional collaborators of the Atlas Group donated work to the archive of the Atlas Group. To give an example, missing Lebanese wars consisting of plates and a notebook was deposited in the Atlas Group archive by a well-known but fictional Lebanese historian named Dr. Fadel Fakouri. Other fictive, fictive legacies of the archive are Asman Tafan, he donated, let's be honest, the weather helped in 1992 to the archive, and Habib Fatala, who they donated, I may die before I get a rifle in 1993. Walid Raad uh, himself also donated work to the archive. We he donated, we decided to let them say, and we are convinced twice. The project of the Atlas Group unfolded between 1989 and 2004. Then he stopped uh, with the archive. By means of the works in the Atlas Group, Agif, uh, uh, Ra, of the Atlas Group archive, Raad questions the mediation and archiving of information. Uh, this artistic, fictional archive, uh, so it's not a real archive, it's a complete fiction, enables the exploration of new epistemic and cognitive models. This new knowledge challenges the kind of knowledge that is disseminated by the dominant mass media and by Western discourses about terrorism, colonialism, and Orientalism. The presentation of artistic works as belonging to an archive directs the attention to the cognitive conflicts and problems thematized by these works. I will explain, this is very abstract, but I will explain it a little later. Walid Raad explains why the archive as a place is the necessary framework uh, for his cognitive project. It's on the slide. I like to think that I always work from facts, but I always proceed from the understanding that there are different kinds of facts. Some facts are historical, some are sociological, some are emotional, some are economic, and some are aesthetic. And some of these facts can sometimes only be experienced in a place we call fiction. I tend to think in terms of different kinds of facts and the places that permit their emergence. So he created this archive, which is just a construction and even a fictional construction, because it is only within that fiction in, within this construction that certain facts can be told or can be presented. Besides uh, fiction, the other place in the work of Walid Raad that permits those facts to emerge and become visible and no, uh, knowable, knowable is the archive. Most people outside Lebanon 
know only vaguely that during the 20th century, wars have been fought with the, Lab uh, with the Lebanese by Israel and among the Lebanese themselves. One remembers especially its glorious past, and namely the capital Beirut as the equivalent to Paris in the Middle East. The very destructive wars that have ruined the country have sunken into oblivion. And who knows in Spain or in the Netherlands about these wars in Lebanon? As a result, they have no real existence anymore. They are no longer present in our memories. By means of his artistic project, integrating fact and fiction, Raad includes and transforms forgotten histories into archivable knowledge. Now, this is the kind of text uh, which was uh, no, written down in Arab next to these uh, cars. I will explain what they are. The documents and images presented by the Atlas Group are not inherently fake or fictional. The text and photographs are not manipulated. But it is their montage and assembling into a narrative or a specific historical situation that propels them into fiction. The montage of image and text or of different images is a specific mode of producing knowledge. And the text and images are never presented at face value, but they always trouble each other. A good example of this use of montage is the notebook, volume 38, already been in a lake of fire, and donated to the Atlas Group archive by the already mentioned Dr. Fadel Fakouri. This file contains 145 photographic images of cars. These cars are of the same brand, model and color as those used in car bomb attacks during the Lebanese wars of 1975 to 1991. Notes and annotations made by Fakouri are attached to the images. They specify information such as uh, the number of casualties, the location and time of the explosion, and the type of explosives used. The documentary information is all real and true. And what is fictional, however, is the bringing together of these different elements in the notebook of the imaginary uh, character of Dr. Fakouri. And of course, the notebook is an archival genre. By using the notebook as the framework, presenting, oh no, sorry, um, by using the notebook as the framework, presenting factual images and notes, they are assigned a cognitive status. It is thanks to this archival genre that the images and notes are no longer disparate em uh, elements without any cognitive value. They become knowable and visible objects through their newly acquired status as archival objects. The fictional archive of the Atlas Group presents, in the words of Chouteau, latency, lapse, and speculation as factors for historical truth equal to those of verification, authenticity, and proof. So that's very strange. So all the images and all the, uh, the descriptions and what happened are all factual truths. But in order to show that, you had to present it within a kind of archival organization. Otherwise, it would not be acknowledged as historical truth. And it needs the archive for that, or an archival organization. But once one is inside an archival organization, other problems arise. One does not exist in an archive in one's unique individual specificity, but as an example of how one is categorized in the archive. This is especially the case in the type of modern archive thing that was developed at the end of the 19th century. As already concluded when I discussed, said a few things about Foucault's notion of the archive, whereas in the old archive, the classical archive, Individuals were used to build or substantiate categories. In the new archive, categories are being used to build or substantiate the individual. You can, uh, this leads to a situation where individual identity is the result of the interaction between human bodies, events, and archives. 
And this identity is then not seen as a subjective interiority, but as an objective exteriority, and especially produced by so-called functional archives. For instance, in the police archive, your only identity is you are a criminal, you are a thief, or you know, something like that. And within um, another functional archive, it is your medical dossier which determines your identity, who you are. One of the radical implications of the new modern archive is that what or, uh, or who uh, is not in the records does not really exist. This drastic consequence is understandable when we realize that archival administrators do not observe, describe, and classify reality, but the other way around. They shape people and events into entities that fit the categorizations and are recordable. And again, this is especially true for the functional archive, not for the storage archive. And this kind of reification entails that there are virtually no other facts than those that are contained in records and archives. The result of this archival practice is pigeonholing. Let me say a few things about that first, and then I'm going to continue with describing these artistic practices. And since the 1990s, a tension has emerged between the archive and narrative as symbolic modes used by human beings to provide meaning to their lives and identities. For centuries, the medium of the archive was considered only as a tool used by especially historians. Storytelling, however, was much more than just a tool. It was a medium of crucial importance for making sense of the past, the present, and the future. But with the rise of the internet and other, other digital media, the subordinated position of the archive has become a dominant one. The story we tell about ourselves has become of less importance than how we are registered by the state, the insurance company, or in our medical files. When one tells a story about oneself, it implies that there has been a change, a development, and growth in who one is. In the 18th century, the notion of building was introduced in order to stress the importance of growth and development. But Bildung has become an almost absolute, uh, obsolete notion. We do not uh, develop, transform, or build our identity, but are pinned down on an identity that is fixed. This inclination to fixating identity is, for example, demonstrated by the recent classifications of gender and sexuality as LHBTQ and so on. And I add, and so on, because again and again, identities so far forgotten or marginalized are added to this listing. Identity is no longer seen um, as a transgression, as a classification you should challenge in order to be free, but as a box in which you feel understood and safe. The irony is that also the cue of queer has been added to this listing of identity. This is ironic because queer, in fact, indicates the resistance against the pigeonholing of identities. But now even queer people are boxed in by making them part of this list. This boxing in, oh no, I will just skip that, otherwise it will be too long. Yeah. Okay, in the rest of my talk, I will focus on artistic practices that reflect on and challenge the three mentioned problems inherent to archival organizations and archival thinking, namely exclusions from the archive, the loss of individuality and specificity, and pigeonholing. It is not by accident that most of the contributions of this project are artistic, or that they discuss artistic practices that rethink and then refigure the archive or archival organization. It is especially, it are especially artists who challenge the problems inherent to archival organization and archival thinking. Quite some contemporary art practices that model themselves on the archive make use of the book, resulting in a so-called artist book. And although the archive as institution is usually not associated with the medium of the book, books quite often contain archival organizations. 
administrative records, for instance, cannot only be found in filing cabinets, but also in book form. Books and tablets are perhaps the earliest media for the, for, uh, the organization of recollection. In that sense, certain art practices that make use of the book can also be seen as archival. Maybe nowadays, uh, because of literature, we, are all, we usually think of uh, books as typically narrative, but that's a misunderstanding. And I think most artists who make artist books do not tell stories, but they uh, make books that are archival. An example of such an archival book practice, transforming exclusions from the archive into an archive in its own right, is the black photo album by South African photographer Santo Mofokeng, already mentioned earlier. The black photo album is the result of an investigation of images that were commissioned by black working and middle class families in South Africa between 1890 and 1950. It was in this period that South Africa developed and implemented a racist political system. In this era, it was still common practice to depict African people in the same visual language as animals, as part of the fauna in their own natural habitats. And so an ethnographic uh, archives represented African people like this. In the ideologies of uh, authoritative knowledge, they were considered as natives, and the official archival images had to confirm such a notion of African people. The photographs commissioned by black people and representing them as bourgeois families did not fit this ideology and were excluded from the archives of official knowledge. These images remain scattered in the private domain and are largely invisible. In the words of uh, Santo Morfo Kang himself, they have been left behind by dead relatives, where they sometimes hang on obscure parlor walls in the townships. In some families, they are uh, coveted as treasures, displacing to totems in discursive narratives about identity, lineage, and personality. And because to some people, photographs contain the shadow of the subject, they are carefully guarded from the ill will of witches and enemies. In other families, they are being destroyed as rubbish during spring cleans because of interruptions in continuity or disaffection with the encapsulated meanings and history of the images. Most often, they lay hidden to rot through the neglect in kists, cupboards, and cardboard boxes and plastic bags. Mofo Kang's uh, black photo album reverses the exclusion of these images from the authoritative uh, public domain. He collects these images and the stories about the subjects of these photographs. It is important that images that have so far been excluded from public archives are now presented within the archival genre of the artist book. But photographs from the black photo album uh, are now also shown within the context of the gallery and the museum too. Uh, there, there are many Western museums who, who bought these works. <laughs> so now suddenly they're part, uh, they're in the public domain in official uh, archival institutions. Mofo Kang pre uh, presents them in a new format in combination with the stories. By doing this, the neglected memories and images are inserted into the public domain and form the archive from which they had been excluded until now. This reanimation of the invisible exclusions from the archive implies much more than bringing to life almost forgotten memories. And by making these images into archivable objects, the, ideo the ideology that subjected African people to the lower orders in the family of men is rewritten. Dutch artist Inge Meijer also uh, presented her archival project, The Plant Collection, in 2019, in the form of an artist book. She researched the archives of the Stedelijk Museum of Amsterdam and discovered something remarkable. Many of the images that documented the exhibitions after the Second World War showed plants as part of the exhibition. Uh, yeah, these images are very small. Let's go to an, uh, also another one here. This is in a way 
That's very strange. Certainly, there's a plant. <laughs> um, many of the images that documented the exhibitions after the Second World War showed plants as part of the exhibition. Mayer investigated the vanished and sub subsequently forgotten vegetation in the museum during the periods between 1945 and 1983. It turned out that director Sandberg had started a new kind of museum display, which was continued by the directors who succeeded him. In those days, there was even one special curator who was responsible for taking care of the Stedelijk Museum's plant collection. In the late 1980s, this practice gradually came to an end. And in her book, The, the Plant Collection, Meyer has collected images that include plants uh, from the official exhibitions, installations, documentation. What we see in these images is not just insignificant details. They point to a buried and largely forget, forgotten history. And Meyer is currently making a similar kind of book, this time based on the collection of photographs of plants in the MoMA in New York. Yeah, because it was not only in the Stedelijk, but in many museums all over the world that they did the same thing. And, the, and this book is now, it was commissioned or is commissioned by the MoMA in New York. Even uh, kijken. No, this is the last example of uh, this project. And the interesting thing is that this is not, has, has nothing to do with including in the archive of what was so far excluded from the archive. And this is just part of the archive of the Stedelijk, but nobody noticed it, what was in the archive because nobody was interested in those plants. So a completely forgotten history buried in the archive. Yeah. Um, in the book uh, Productive Archiving, it is Annette Decker who discusses another significant archival artist book. And it's called it's Anna Genes, number uh, 235, Encyclopedia of an Allotment, in 2000, uh, and she published that in 2010. This book looks like a taxonomic work, but it doesn't focus on the conventional categories of plant and animal life. Categories such as insects, mammals, or garden plants are not used. The book has three parts. The third part, for example, contains all kinds of measurements, uh, such as the group behavior of snails, the speed of ducks, the camouflage of frogs, and the effects of sunlight on leaves. And, this, uh, and all these observations, it's all about her own little garden, her allotment. And so, that's where, uh, on which the, all her observations are based. Her approach seemed to be modeled on that of a scientist or biologist. But being an artist as well, her taxonomic look is based purely on what can be... Uh, yeah, this is an image of her garden. Uh, but being an artist uh, as well, her taxonomic look is based purely on what can be seen, on visual similarities, contrast, and patterns. Important is that not only the book itself is an archive, but she also deals with the photographs in her taxonomic collection as archives. As Decker quotes her, I quote, I see photography as an information carrier with which different stories can be told. Uh, yeah, the same can be said about archives. And earlier I've written a book uh, about photography, and it was just published in Spanish. Uh, um, and there, uh, the, the, the archiving of, photographies, of photography creates all kinds of problems. Uh, because a photograph, in a way, uh, is an image of the world. But, but yeah, how do you categorize that? What you see in the image is extremely difficult. So the, 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 the archiving of, pho of photography is much more difficult than the archiving of uh, paintings, for instance. And that has to happen because with paintings you have all these different uh, genres, for instance, very uh, conventional. But with a lot of photographs, that's just not possible. To, and so that's, that's, no, photo specialists have a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with that. Uh, yeah. 
Decker concludes that the difference between this artistic taxonomy and scientific taxonomies is that the former leads to completely new surprising insights. For example, that you had to reconsider snails not as loathsome enemies who are after my precious lettuce, but as interesting notes in the community that perhaps move according to certain unknown, at least to me, rules. To understand the work, that's the next, uh, let's see, this is another example of her book. And I think, yeah, another one. You, you see completely, she, she is also in putting in this archive things which have nothing to do with each other at first sight from a biological point of view. Uh, here she is the kind of holes which are left by stones and the stones themselves and now what has it to do with the plants and the animals in her garden. Uh, yeah, and now I'm going to talk about this. To understand the work of the French artist photographer Mathieu Pernot, one needs Asman's distinction between functional and storage archives. Pernot's work does not consist of individual images, but of assemblages of photos in book or exhibition form. So it is very, although he makes very beautiful photographs, it is very important not to see them as individual images. They are always part of an assemblage. In the case of his project with Roma people and families, he does not make a representation of a family through photography, but a photographic history. It is a history of images, of practices of photography that were used to represent Roma people. His books, as well as his exhibitions, are then an, an assemblage of uh, images and photographic genres instead of a storage or collection of individual images. And uh, here you see uh, an assemblage like that on the uh, exhibition ball. But all the books he makes, he usually makes also art, an artist book or a book, whatever uh, you call it, and there he does exactly the same. By doing this, Pernod has rewritten the archival registers that were traditionally used to portray Roma people. Whereas the kind of archival collections used to portray Roma were so far functional archives, especially ethnographic or uh, anthropometric archives. Mathieu Pernod has revisited these archives and transformed them into a storage archives. Uh, his storage archive, Ligorgan, 1995 till 2015, enables the viewer to imagine uh, and see real individual people with their own histories and memories. Uh, you see, these are, the, in a way, the conventional anthropomorphic photos taken of Roma people. And those kind of photos were, for instance, also taken in Auschwitz of everybody who entered uh, uh, that concentration camp. But also, uh, these photographs were taken, for instance, in France, in uh, Vinci, uh, for those who were also deported to the camps. And, but yeah, they can still be found in French archives. And, um, and what uh, 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 Mathieu Pernod uh, does in, in uh, his books, but also in his exhibitions, combining these kind of images which images he has taken, but also uh, just family portraits, which are found in the family. And he also asks these uh, Roma people to make photographs of themselves. So the, the nature of these assemblage of images is completely uh, diverse. Uh, Merapi Obermeyer, uh, also she has a kind of story or narrative uh, in this book challenges the boxing in of identities in her personal short text, uh, that's the title, Does the fact that I fall for men make me a woman? This is a, no. That's a, a, a strange question at first sight. In her case, she even refuses all identity uh, distinction, for, for identity feels for her like a stigma. She can only live in what she calls an androgynous society. Having grown up with her parents in the last leaper colony in the Netherlands, she has suffered from ghettoizing identities in the most extreme way. Her identity of being the child of a father who suffered from leprosy 
didn't only put her into a specific conceptual box, but also isolated her into a real place, a colony. As a result, she has a fundamental distrust of any identity, for identity has been pigeonholing to her in an almost literal sense. Uh, even the basic distinction between man and woman has performative effects that she, with this extraordinary background, experiences as harmful. Uh, I forgot some of the other. No, this is still the, the Gorgon. Oh, no. Yeah. Although her personal background is different than that of many of us, it does not mean that her experience of the pigeonholing of identities is unique. I would like to suggest that her very extreme personal story is emblematic, and it is uh, thanks to her exceptional experience that she understands the harmful effects of pigeonholing as such. Argentinian artist Sebastian Diaz Morales takes yet a different archival route. The word archive does not only refer to ordered collections of books, documents, and objects, but also to the building in which those collections are housed. An archive has also an architectural dimension. This suggests that architecture does not only provide space to people, but also to memories. In Diaz Morales' work, uh, video works, Passages, he takes a walk through architecture as a means of archiving and collecting memories. In his Passages 1 and 2, uh, memories of the last Argentinian military dictatorship are being archived by means of a walk through guilty spaces, spaces where things happened and where uh, the regime performed their dictatorship in the cruelest, most cruel ways. This notion of memory in relation to architecture resonates with the famous view of memory presented by Francis Yates, who traced the theories of memory from antiqu antiquity on before the invention of prints came along to assist us in memorizing. She focused especially on the art of memorizing by means of a walk through a house. Each room becomes the storage space for specific memories and space becomes the host of time. This architectural practice in the service of memorization was especially used in rhetoric. In order to memorize the order of one's argumentation, one could best walk through the subsequent spaces of an architectural building, imaginary or not. Many artists have taken up Yeats' vision, among whom the Italian writer Italo Calvino. Sebastian Diaz Morales, too, steps into Yeats' footsteps, consciously or not. Um, the, pa the passages in his passages are not just passages through architectural space, but at the same time through time lost. The architecture activates memories of events that took place in these spaces. Of course, only the people who are knowledgeable about these buildings in Buenos Aires and the specific events that took place there will recognize buildings and particular memories connected to them. But that's not necessarily the point of these uh, passages through architecture. The point is that the viewer is affected by the burden of memory that uh, architecture may carry, and our architecture is archival in several respects. Okay, I think I have one more case, almost ready. Spanish artist Pablo Lerma from Barcelona with our, uh, works with archives and he challenges the homogenizing effect, effects of the archive. Archives are not objective, but subjective, because the inclusion or exclusion of materials is often based on biases in existing categories. For his installation, um, yeah, it doesn't stop at images, for instance. Lerma collected thousands of images of the gay archives in Amsterdam and of the Dutch gay magazine Homologie. After researching these images, Lerma concluded that even the, these gay archives followed the stereotypes of gay culture. It is dominant, uh, dominated by the dominant forms of masculinity and male beauty. Being himself married to a man and having three children, Lerma was especially interested 
uh, in images of care and uh, in queer families, but there were almost none in this archive. Now, th no, that's the last uh, case. Yeah, for some time now, South African artist William Kentridge use, uh, uses old dictionaries and encyclopedias for his works. For his works on paper, he superimposes text and images on pages from these old archival books. His animated film, Sybil, was also made on such pages as backgrounds on which new images were created and superimposed. This film was first conceived for and developed uh, from his chamber opera, Waiting for the Sybil, which was commissioned by the Teatro dell'Opera di Roma in 2019. The fact that he uses pages from old dictionaries for his recent work can be understood as Kentridge's renegotiation uh, re with the colonial past of Africa. Western notions and paradigms of knowledge were also imposed on colonialized cultures. As a result, Western notions of time and space were introduced into cultures that so far experienced time and space differently. Although this important element of colonization was considered to be the equivalent of modernization, the price to pay for this modernization was high. Kentridge's superimposition of images and text of old archival books introduced into Africa as part of colonization is a way of challenging the colonial identity of African countries. And now, my very short conclusion. When the archive is used in this way, or when an archival practice succeeds in realizing this potential of the archive, it is utterly uh, productive. In this talk, I discussed a variety of problems archival organizations confront us with. Avoiding the archive because of these problems is not an issue, eh? because archival organization is a basic symbolic mode on the basis of which we organize, organize our life, the past, the present, and the future. And we should not confuse the classical archive with the modern archive or the functional archive with the storage archive. Each kind of archive brings with it different kinds of problems. What I suggest is that it's best to explore constructive and creative solutions for these problems. And especially artistic archives seems to be able to develop these possible solutions because they are more conscious of the conventional problems to archival organization. Thank you. And sorry for